It was a different world back then. The idea back then that the IMF and others had was the world economy would grow at 3.3% in 2020. The idea now is that it'll probably shrink. And the idea then was that the Indian economy would be growing at 6%. Now it may not be growing. The US economy would grow at two and a half. Now it'll shrink by two and a half. World oil price was $55 a barrel. Now it's $20 a barrel. Unemployment forecast for the United States now are 17 to 25%. For India, perhaps 24%. Our distinguished panelists will talk about the US-India business opportunities in the context of these shocks, COVID-19 pandemic shock, the demand shock, the supply shock. And to lead this group of distinguished panelists and to moderate the discussion is my good friend, Gunjan Bagla. Gunjan is an author, a consultant, and a lecturer, and please let me turn over the microphone and the camera to Gunjan. Thank you, uh, Dick. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to host this, uh, uh, moderate this webinar. Uh, I run a company called Amrit, where we help US companies work with Indian companies. And I spent most of last night working late, trying to secure about uh, 3 million bottles from India for uh, hand sanitizer uh, to be produced in the United States. And when I woke up this morning, I, I flipped around and was looking for COVID test kits to be able to send to India uh, because India has 1.3 billion people and will require a fair number of those uh, to be tested. Uh, so this is a very real problem and a real opportunity in terms of trade and relations between the world's two largest democracies. Uh, the other bit of news that everyone should know about is that today, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India approved the shipment of 29 million doses of hydro hydroxychloroquine, uh, which are produced in, India produces 70% of that drug, of the world's supply of that drug, and 29 million doses are going to be headed to the United States, uh, reversing a ban that the, the government of India had placed just a few days ago. So we are actually seeing the partnership play out very, very much live as we are talking uh, today. Uh, trade between the United States and India was only about $18 billion about 15 years ago. Today, it has risen to $150 billion. And the ambition is that it might grow up to $500 billion. But now let's make it very low to our community in Southern California on a number of fronts. And let me step away from trade for a moment. So today, most of us aren't shaking hands anymore. We are performing the Indian gesture of namaste to greet one another, okay? Today, many, many Americans who used to frown upon meditation and yoga are using those mechanisms, those practices to reduce the stress that we are all experiencing. Uh, that is what I call India inside. That's what I call India's soft power influencing Western and worldwide culture today. Now here in Southern California, we are, which is the home of uh, several of the meditators and yogis who came from India and settled down here. So, uh, you know, before we get into business and politics, I think it's important to recognize the cultural connections between the, the two, uh, two largest democracies in the world and how they are centered very much on Southern California. Some of you might know that the first Indian American congressman elected to the US House of Representatives was actually elected right here in Southern California in the Imperial Valley, the Leap Singh Sons, uh, shortly after Indians were allowed to become citizens of the United States uh, in the early 1950s. Uh, and then turning to business, a uh, couple of things I wanted to point out. India is the largest owner of the C-17 transport aircraft outside of the US Air Force. The C-17 was built right here in the Boeing plant in Long Beach. And in fact, our panelist, Dr. Ravi Tilak has something to do with, uh, with aircraft that we'll get into in a minute. Then you turn to JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, and they are running a project which will be the world's most expensive remote sensing satellite. It's called NISAR. 
and NISAR stands for the NASA ISRO Strategic uh, Aperture Radar. It will be a remote sensing satellite built by the Indians and working jointly with JPL that will launch in 2022, a one and a half billion dollar project. So there's many, many ways that we are collaborating between the two cultures and the two societies. And I want to turn for a moment to look at the university collaborations and ask uh, Dr. Roman works here to tell us a little bit about the university collaborations. He's a professor at UCLA. So would you spend a minute or so, uh, Roman, and tell us what's happening in Southern California? Yes, uh, thank you, Gunjan. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to, to speak today. And thank you to the other panelists for joining as well. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so we at UCLA have a lot of connections with India that we're trying to increase and foster. Uh, we have an international institute with a center on South Asia that is very active in bringing uh, Indian scholars to campus and vice versa, sending uh, UCLA scholars to India and uh, in the school where I teach, the business school, we have a very active India program where we have a, a, a almost annual MBA study trip to India that I run and I bring uh, 40 or 50 students uh, to visit businesses and uh, uh, government uh, organizations, uh, civil society um, institutions uh, in India. And it's a, it's a full course. So students take a course entitled uh, The Business Environment of India. And we're very keen to uh, uh, increase the ties that we have uh, with India. That's the UCLA piece, uh, uh, and I'm sure that uh, Richard would be able to speak more about what USC is doing. I know that it's something that every university is looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, very closely, and it's also uh, the result of our uh, greater involvement uh, with Indian students. Uh, we admit a greater and greater share of Indian students every year, and uh, it's becoming an extremely important uh, export market, you could say, for educational services for us. Right, and uh, so before we go to Richard, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, while, while Roman may not look Indian, his parents were actually lived in India and became naturalized Indian citizens, and Roman travels to India several times a year, taking his students there and so on. So very close ties to India personally, professionally, family-wise as well. Uh, Dick, do you want to tell us a little bit about USC or uh, and its involvement with India. I know that Ratan Tata was on your on your university's board of advisors for some time, as was Narayan Murthy, two very famous Indians. Yes, at, at the leadership level, we've had prominent Indians on the on the board of trustees. Um, in terms of student flows, there's a couple of thousand Indian students at USC, mostly at the graduate uh, schools, and uh, the business school, the Marshall School of Business, has run a course on India for many, many years. It's what we call Prime, Doing Business in India. And it's a semester long course that uh, culminates in a group of 30 students going to India and having done some research on the various Indian companies, then meeting with the executives and uh, talking to them there. Awesome. Now, of, course, of course, we all worry that with the US consulates closed in India for, for visas, um, what will happen in the coming year? And we hope that these, uh, the back is broken of the, the pandemic in India quickly and so that the embassies and the consulates will reopen the visa windows. Absolutely, we're very hopeful that that will happen sooner rather than later, but uh, certainly this will go on for a, for a little while. Uh, so let me turn to uh, Ravi Tilak. And Ravi, can you tell us uh, a little bit about your business and your involvement in India? You have to unmute yourself. Ravi, we can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. But, okay, it's, it was, uh, now you can hear me. Yes. Our business is to supply aluminum, aerospace and defense grade alloy making process equipment and technologies all over the world. And so India being a large market, Naturally, we are there uh, more in a wholesome way, I would say. We started a relationship with uh, a very large corporation in India to manufacture these alloys over there uh, jointly with this company. 
for benefit of ISRO and DRDO and several other Indian establishments. Yeah, DRDO being the Defense Research the Development Defense Organization, Defense which Development is like uh, uh, right. you know the the R and D part of the India's Ministry of Defense. Very true. Yeah, yeah. And ISRO stands for the Indian Space Research Program, which is similar to NASA of USA. Okay, uh, then we have uh, Praful Kulkarni with the with the prettiest background among all of us, and uh, those are his you know his company's pieces of work. On the top, you'll see the control tower for LAX, and uh, his company has built has participated in the building of the extension of the Tom Bradley Terminal, uh, and uh, there's another building from India which I'll let Praful talk about. And Praful, tell us some of the iconic buildings you've done here in the US as well as in India? Well, what you see, um, hello everyone. Uh, what you see to my right is the Jacobs Medical Center uh, Tower that is actually on the campus of uh, University of California, San Diego. And it is an iconic uh, structure, which has won uh, several awards for patient care and how it was designed. Uh, to my left is actually a, a regional headquarters for TCS in India. And the company- TCS being Tata Consultancy Services, a, a company with 400,000 employees of which at least 100,000 are here in the US today. That is correct. And so our relationship uh, to India goes back to 2001, uh, nearly 10 years after India opened up. Uh, I'm an architect uh, by training, and my passion has always been architecture and construction. And uh, I'm a principal with Canon Design. Uh, Canon Design is uh, over uh, 1,200 people internationally. We have offices in North America, in Canada, US, as well as in India. And our India staff is uh, very capable of doing some wonderful work, uh, which actually started uh, in kind of a low tech, uh, translating uh, hand-drawn or hard drawings into CAD. And now it is a full-fledged operation. Uh, in India, we have done a number of projects for the Tata Trust, uh, which are hospital projects. Uh, that's one of our specialties. And um, we work seamlessly with India. And this is an exciting opportunity uh, for us, all of us, uh, to talk about how we can further this relationship between US and India, uh, which is a wonderful opportunity for all of us. Thank you, Praful. So, uh, Ravi, uh, you and I have talked about how the relationship between the two countries is growing and what might be the limitations or the hidden problems that limit the growth of this relationship. It's gone from 15 billion to 150 billion. Uh, why, you know, India was the 23rd largest trading partner to the US. Now it is among the top 10, maybe the ninth largest trading partner. What's holding it back, Ravi? You have some special insights on that. See, the relationship happens on three fronts, you know, country to country relationships. One is a government to government relationship. One is corporations to corporations relationships. And one is people to people relationship. So it's very heartwarming to see that the, this relationship between India and US are in sync on all these three fronts, which is very rare. You can have a, the only fourth front on which it is trying to come into synchronization is the culture front. And what I mean by culture front is uh, the front regarding uh, mannerisms, diet likings, as well as uh, the breadths of languages and the expressions and the styles and the moving of your head and acknowledging things and how you say, how often you say thank you and how often you take thank you for granted. So these cultural relationships are, are getting developed, but the other three relationships are pretty much uh, on a well-developed path, in my opinion. Right, excellent. That's a wonderful point that you make, Ravi. Uh, some of you might know that I wrote a book called Doing Business in 21st Century India, 
and it was published one year after the same publisher, Warner Books, had written a book on China, and they said, follow the exact same formula. And I said, no, I can't, because India is very different from China. And one of the things I did was move up the chapter on cross-cultural communication right to the front of the book. Because most Americans, when they think about Indians, they think about their Indian doctor or the Indian motel where they have stayed at and say, say hey, I could communicate with, with, with Dr. Patel, so I must be able to communicate with people in India. Whereas when I go to China, I don't speak the language and I need an interpreter. And my point was that while Indians may speak English, they really don't think American. And to make that bridge you know, is very, very important because uh, you can hear the words, you can hear the sentences, but you may not get the hidden meaning behind what people are saying. So that cross-cultural gap, I think, is, uh, is very important to fill. And you will see if you, uh, we won't get into a lot of detail, but this whole business about uh, hydroxy chloroquine being shipped from India to the US is a great example of cross-cultural miscommunication. Okay, uh, well, well no, I will say it's a great example of the, of the government to government relationship happening in parallel with the person to person relationship also happening. Yes. You should uh, applaud the audacity with which the US president had the nerve to demand these medicines from him. <laughs> now, only a friend can, de can demand things from yes. a friend. Yes. You see? Yes. So we, I see a lot of um, uh, cross bridging happening. And the same thing is with the corporations. If you look at John Chambers, what he has to offer is fantastic. You know, he he's almost saying, hey, American companies, reinvent your way, you reinvent yourself now, the Indian way. Right. John Chambers being the former CEO of uh, Cisco. Exactly. And when he was CEO, he did something very unusual. He established uh, Cisco 2 as the, as the Indian location. So equal headquarters in Bangalore and in Santa Clara for one of the world's largest companies. Yeah. And since he has retired from Cisco, he has taken a very active interest in developing the US-India relationship through an organization that, that he and others have created. Uh, so Praful, where do you see the relationship between the two countries going? And is this crisis bringing the two countries closer together or further apart? Well, you know, I have a perspective on this. Um, at heart, I am uh, all for liberal democracies. And that's why I think it's a natural partnership between the US and the United States. We currently have pretty strong leaders in Prime Minister Modi and President Trump. And they are friends and they are decisive and they make certain decisions that we may not all agree with. And both of them have had those kind of issues, but they are decisive. And they have a bonhomie between the two of them. And I believe that we need to take advantage of that situation. Uh, because we are democracies, these leaders may be gone in a few years, someone else may be elected. So while the relationship is good between these two people, uh, we have to deepen this relationship. And you talked about the malaria uh, medi medication where India initially said, no, no, we need all this medication as we all know. India is a leader in pharmaceuticals, especially in the generic drug industry. And this medicine has been around for some time. Though having that relationship, like Ravi said, is actually a good thing where uh, friends can demand things from other friends. So um, uh, the ban has been partially lifted. So I see that kind of relationship evolving and uh, how we can further these bonds that we really started to open uh, in the late 60s. Excellent. Roman, what is your perspective on this? Where do you see the relationship going, given that you've been going back and forth between the two countries for so long? So I very much share Praful's perspective that liberal democracy is something that uh, unites the two countries. And in fact, 
uh, after the Second World War, uh, when the Cold War started, India and uh, the United States went kind of separate ways, I would say, but it was always in the, um, in the natural order of things that they should be uh, much closer. Uh, and I think when the Cold War ended and India started to liberalize, two events that coincided in time, uh, uh, you know, it was natural for the US to get closer to India. Now, it took a long time for that to lead to, uh, to the current relationship with the numbers that you mentioned at the beginning, $150 billion of trade and a huge amount of FDI, which by the way, goes both ways. It's also the case that uh, uh, Indian companies uh, invest in the U.S. economy. Uh, yeah, absolutely. In uh, fact, the company that Ravi is Ravi's company is working with, uh, you know, has made a almost a six billion dollar investment in buying uh, one of the world's largest aluminum companies here in the U.S., Novellus, yeah. which is now owned by by uh, one of the largest business houses in India. Most Americans don't realize it. And this is the phenomenon that I describe as India inside. You know, yeah. that a lot of things are happening in the US that have a connection to India that the average person doesn't even realize is the case. I teach my students about Indian multinationals now. Uh, and I provide a list uh, that I think uh, BCG put together of multinationals in the world. And what you see when you look at time is how, uh, you know, uh, how, how many new Indian multinationals are making the list. Uh, but so I think that's the broad context, you know, of, uh, it, uh, you know, that Indian uh, US uh, economic relations uh, were always going to get closer and we're seeing that happen. At the same time, I think we, we have to be um, lucid about some of the obstacles that still exist uh, in the relationship. And maybe that this is something we can uh, talk about. There are some issues and there, there are not many, and they're certainly not as severe as, say, in the U.S.-China uh, economic relationship. But there are some issues that are uh, points of contention and disagreement, and those are things on which the the, the two leaders currently are are working. Uh, some of them are anecdotally uh, kind of interesting to discuss, uh, like the uh, dispute that they had over the importation of Harley Davidson motorcycles, uh, you know, where India was imposing a 75 percent. Uh, tariff on, on, on those motorcycles. And Trump called Modi and got the tariff down to 50% uh, uh, and then concluded the conversation saying, that's not enough, you know, should be lower than that. Um, we impose no uh, uh, tariffs on Indian motorcycles, which I, I don't think the US imports uh, uh, too many of, but uh, the, maybe they should, because I think India is one of the largest, if not the largest maker of uh, motorcycles in the entire world. So there are some issues, and uh, uh, beyond this anecdote, there are issues having to do with agricultural products, with uh, increasingly now tech. Uh, uh, there are issues with uh, foreign direct investment, and maybe those are some things we can uh, we can discuss. Right, right. Thank you, you know, so much, Roman. Then, uh, I thought I would add this piece to the conversation that obviously there is uh, India is still a developing country, and U.S. is the largest economic power, uh, military power. And uh, just to kind of put things in context, when the British finally left India in 1947, the average lifespan was 35 years for Indians. The illiteracy was uh, in the 82, 83% range. And the population was 350 million. So when you start to look at how much progress has been made since 1947, but it is still a developing country. It is barely getting into the middle income country. And um, that means they need to protect certain industries while opening up the markets, getting new technologies, and obviously there are areas in India that have done very, very well, uh, software and hard, uh, uh, IT sectors, uh, all the major tech companies are there, but there needs to be some patience between a developed large economy and a developing economy. Yeah, point taken, absolutely. Uh, now, uh, Richard, I know that you founded the uh, International Business Center Cyber at USC many years ago, and you have extensive dealings with economies all across Asia. 
I'd love to get your perspective on what might be done to improve business between the US and India. You travel to Asia many times a year yourself. Uh, I used to speak at your Asia Pacific Business Outlook Conference for about 15 years at USC. So give us your perspective, uh, Dekha, on, on what, what you think should happen, what India should do, what the US should do. Can you unmute yourself, please? I, th I think without any particular policy changes, U.S. firms are going to be, as a result of the COVID pandemic and as a result of the, the U.S.-China trade war of the last year or so, are going to be diversifying some of their supply sources out of India, uh, out of China, excuse me, to other places. And we've seen that already uh, with Vietnam and the Philippines and, and Taiwan moving certain uh, operations there as a result of trade war. But as a result of the COVID-19, I think th firms are going to think we want to have at least two two or three different supply sources for parts of our supply chain. So I, I think that will happen naturally. Um, the, the thing about doing more business in India, uh, one of the issues is, of course, that Thousands and thousands of Indians, uh, top Indian uh, students study in the United States, but very few of them go home. Uh, and, and so the, the difference between India and China is that so many of the Chinese students after graduating from our business school or engineering school go back home to China, and then they are a natural link to the United States for doing business because right. they've studied and worked and learned here. They've made connections here. And, and uh, they are a natural link to accelerate that. It does not happen with uh, Indian students, and I don't know if it will in the future, but uh, that's a, a different poll that we have. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. So I want to invite the audience to start sending in questions. We've received a few questions. We will get to those momentarily. And uh, in the meantime, we are going to switch to talking about uh, politics a little bit. And I want to start with something that uh, US policymakers began doing maybe six or eight years ago. You know, the, that part of the world is often referred to historically as the Asia Pacific region. Asia Pacific, including most of the countries in Asia, you know, Japan, China, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, India, the ASEAN countries in Southeast Asia, and then Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, right? But US strategists began using a different term, starting with the Defense Department and then going on to the State Department. And they now refer to that region as the Indo-Pacific. Okay. Very specifically, you will see repeated mentions of the word Indo-Pacific, which almost did not occur at all in US State Department or US Defense Department language uh, eight or 10 years ago. And there's a very definite reason why they are doing this, but I'll let our panelists kind of address that. Uh, it has caused some controversy, at least in one other major country in that part of the world. Uh, so Roman, do you want to start with that? Sure, I mean, I think uh, rhetoric tends to follow uh, pol big political trends. And this is one in which uh, the US-China uh, relationship was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, had more tensions and where there was a lot of uh, uh, closeness between the US and India. And so the substitution of the word uh, Asia, uh, you know, by the word in Indo, uh, you know, is, a, is sort of a sim symbol of that uh, renewed emphasis on the US-India relationship in a context where the, the US-China relationship is showing, uh, a, you know, much more tension than in the past. Certainly the contrast with the early 2000s when China obtained uh, permanent uh, trading, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, privileges in the U.S. and then subsequently entered the WTO. Uh, you know, we're we're a long way from that now. In the current political environment, uh, something like that would uh, probably not occur, uh, irrespective of who's in power. I think there's a broad political consensus on, uh, you know, adopting a, a much more antagonistic uh, stance toward China. And so you're seeing this change of, em of emphasis. And I, uh, I think that the, this is an instance where the rhetoric follows the, the geopolitics. Yeah. Uh, Ravi, I know that you have 
connections into the Indian political machine at the highest levels, to put it mildly. What is the reaction in India to this term, uh, Indo-Pacific? Uh, do, do Indian planners like it? Uh, do they embrace it? Uh, and how are they reacting to China's pushback on that term? Well, the pushback has been answered logically. You know, there is a large body of water in that part of the world, which is called Indian Ocean. So anything that is connected with Indian Ocean naturally needs to be termed as Indo-Pacific region of the world. And uh, after that argument was given, everybody is, uh, has calmed down overall. Okay, okay, good, good. So now, now the broader political factors between the two countries, uh, uh, the US and India, and how, uh, you know, we have to, of course, talk about the elephant in the room now, uh, COVID-19 as well, but for a moment, let's, can, can Praful, can you address the issues about the political alignment between the two countries? What's good, what's not? Well, uh, I believe that the Indo-Pacific region is really the U.S. attempt uh, to form a, an alliance with India, Japan, uh, Australia. These are the three larger partners in, in the area. Right. They call it the Quad. Exactly. And it is important that these again, uh, liberal democracies need to start building a stronger network. And if there are issues about, for example, uh, this whole Huawei 5G situation uh, between United States and China, where there is this allegation that there is surveillance going on through 5G. So, Creating these supply chains within the liberal democracies, I think is an important aspect of this relationship. And I believe that if you look at the logic of it, it makes sense that you need to have these alternate supply chains in situations that we're looking at. Got it, okay. Let me start addressing some of the questions that have come in. And again, I invite the audience to send in more questions. Um, so we have a question from Yifei Sun uh, relating to COVID. Why does India have such a low number of confirmed cases? Could you offer some insights into this issue? You know, the number of cases in India is in the low thousands, I think. Uh, anybody want to take that question? Well, nobody's a doctor here, so anybody's guess is as good as mine. Mm -hmm. And I will give my marks to uh, turmeric and to the diet and to the natural immunity that uh, Indian spices are able to build within a person's body. Absolutely. You know, everything my grandmother used to say, and she only had a fourth grade education, seems to be coming true, you know. Uh, don't shake hands. It's a dirty practice. Wash your hands before and after a meal. You know, eat lots of turmeric. You know, maybe some garlic. You know, all of these things are now being validated by Western science. So yes, absolutely, there's a dimension to that. But also, I think there's another dimension that the amount of testing that has been done in India is is very very low. And I'm personally involved in that, so I can tell you that uh, that that is a factor. Now, the Supreme Court of India this morning ruled that the government must offer free testing to everybody who wants it. So they cannot charge, you know, nobody can be charged for a COVID-19 test. And I imagine that uh, this will create, you know, a fairly large number of tests and the number of positive cases will go up. As you know, many people can have COVID-19 and never even realize that they did. So some of that will start to come out. So I'm sure the numbers will, will start to rise. Uh, I don't know how much they will rise. That's something hard to say. It's hard to practice social distancing in a country as which is nine times the, you know, the population density of the United States and the cities and the slums of India are much, much more dense. 
So there is, you know, there's a potential risk there that I think we will see play out very soon. Uh, the, and that if I, may, and, may add, I think that's one thing, there, there are several factors that uh, uh, both can lead to serious concerns about the future of the epidemic in India, and in particular, uh, the density, as you mentioned, of the population, which makes transmission so much easier. Uh, and also the fact that there are lots of people that have respiratory problems because of the air pollution that might also create, uh, you know, sources of concern. On the other hand, on the flip side of that, there's also a very youthful population. And so perhaps the fatality rate might be uh, lower than in places like Italy that have a much higher percentage of the population that is uh, you know, uh, uh, older. And, and another factor might be the coming heat of the summer, because I think I've seen quite a bit of evidence uh, in the scientific literature that the, this particular virus is quite sensitive to heat and that might help stem the overall spread. So I think it's anyone's guess where it's going to go, but, uh, and there are risk factors as well as alleviating factors, but it's, uh, it's a situation that's quite specific. Uh, uh, perhaps we could think about the, uh, and talk about the government's policy response to the situation uh, and, and, you know, try to evaluate it. I don't know if this is something you want to, uh, to also discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Gunjan, I may add that um, if it is true that he does resist the virus uh, in the way that uh, Roman is talking about, the fundamental issue in India is India only spends about 1% of its GDP on healthcare. So if things should really go awry, I think we could have a catastrophe and we just hope that these other factors would come in where 50% of the population is under 26, the heat situation, and as well as, I mean, India can obviously produce a lot of uh, pharmaceuticals there are certain other strengths that are there, but it potentially is a worrisome prospect if the disease is as prevalent as it has been in the Northern Hemisphere, it's a worrying prospect. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just looking at the questions here. Uh, uh, there's a question from somebody that we all might know on this panel, uh, Dr. David Carl. Uh, He's struck by how optimistic we are about the relations between the two countries. Uh, and he says, are we being, are we being too rosy? Uh, uh, Dr. Carl is associated with USC over for a number of years and I, somebody I respect. So uh, would, uh, would someone give a response to his question? Well, I'll, I'll give it a shot one, one time. And uh, Roman, you can uh, talk about this. You, you probably study more than I do in this area. But if you look at this, you know, if you go back to India's posture after independence, it was a non-aligned country. So it really didn't want to be in the Soviet Russian uh, sphere, nor in the NATO or US allied uh, sphere. And the relationship between US and India uh, had really, it was very rocky uh, through the 70s. And now where it is, I mean, you can tell the difference. So uh, I, I am an optimist by nature and I believe that trend continue because of the natural affinities that we talked about. Yeah, let me, let me just return to the uh, questions about uh... COVID-19, there's a couple of interesting suggestions from the audience. Uh, you know, we talked about how India has such a high rate of malaria, which is why India produces the largest amount of, uh, of the uh, anti-malarial drug. But there's another disease which is very common in India and that's tuberculosis. And because of tuberculosis uh, being so common, it's uh, the vaccinations, the VCG vaccine that is given, uh, you know, to, to uh, limit tuberculosis is quite common in India. And there's, you know, a couple of our audience members are hypothesizing whether that vaccination might also be a factor in producing immunity for COVID-19. I have not seen any literature on this. I have not seen any evidence of this, but that's an interesting hypothesis. Um, let's see if there are any other questions on 
the COVID-19 subject, and then we'll switch to other factors if we can. Um, is there some redundancy in the question? So I'm not going through all of them. Um, so let's move on to some other topics that uh, that people have brought up here. The somebody is asking about the Sino-India Special Economic Zone. How does India think of its economic relationship with China? Uh, Anybody have a viewpoint on that? India has a tremendous amount of trade with China. It used to be roughly balanced until recently, and then Chinese imports have continued to rise. Uh, but uh, I haven't heard of a Chinese Indian special economic zone. Is this, can someone address that question? I... Well, the border between China and India is not very conducive of establishing such a joint economic zone. Whereas border between Pakistan and China offers that possibility. The, all the supply chain routes, if you were to establish such a zone, go through uh, high altitudes and treacherous mountains. So I don't see, unless it's a fully captive uh, special economic zone in one country and having its satellite uh, zone in another country. Right, right, yeah. And that's kind of what the IT service companies in India are doing, you know, they're setting up operations in Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, you know, whether it's Tata Consultancy or uh, Mahindra or uh, Cognizant, they all have significant operations in China. And then the Chinese companies, the Chinese telecom companies have significant operations in India because they are using Indian programmers to be able to develop the next generation of their products. So that, that's both of those trends are certainly going on in parallel with the growing US-India relationship. See, the um, US-India relationship, I, I have a different slant on it. If you, and um, Professor asked, why is it so rosy in the opinion of this panel? And I could speak that, I could say that, you know, US and India, are like long lost brothers of mother England. There is abundant of English being spoken among the intelligentsia on both sides. So when language doesn't continue to act as a barrier there is, and democracy prevails in both places, naturally the relationship has to keep growing on a day by day basis. So uh, it won't be too optimistic to say that all the countries which are the Commonwealth countries are likely to have, and today uh, performing democracies are likely to have very strong ties with the United States in years ahead. And India is just one of those. Yeah, yeah that's a great point. Um, we have another question about philanthropists and nonprofits and high net worth individuals. How are they st stepping up to address the needs created by, by uh, COVID-19? Um, I'm not sure if the questioner is asking this in the context of uh, people within India or people within the US or going across borders. Uh, anybody want to take that question? I guess uh, part of it anyways. Uh, we basically have, you know, the U.S. model for entropy is um, well known in terms of the tax benefits that come through philanthropy. Whereas in India, that not, has not been the case um, over the years. So that is a newer practice. Um, so there are differences, but it need, needs to be bridged. Now, of course, the Tata Trust, for example, they, they set these trusts up some time ago and these, those have been highly endowed and they are stepping forward. So I believe that the tax structure needs to change or the incentives need to change in India so that people who are wealthy can use the same model that we currently use in the United States. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Now I should point out that uh, the, you know, uh, Praful mentioned the Tata Trust. So the Tata companies, there's 91 of them. And the, you know, the Tata family itself owns less than 1% of them. Most of them, most of the stock was donated to these charitable trusts. And if you look at the tata.com website, they, they use some very unusual language to describe themselves. They say they are capitalist in function, but socialist in nature. I challenge you to find those words on the website of any American company. Okay. And immediately following the COVID-19 crisis, they have jumped in, the Tata companies have jumped in at every possible level to be able to help their local communities and to help uh, the country at large. The other very prominent uh, person that I should mention is Azim Premji, the founder and chairman of Wipro, which is one of India's largest IT services companies. His foundation has done a tremendous amount of uh, charitable work and has also stepped forward to, uh, to help out in the, in the COVID-19 crisis. Now here in the United States, where we have 3 million people of Indian origin living in the United States, there are many, many examples. I get the India West newsletter every day, and there are countless examples of how entrepreneurs, hotel owners, uh, small business people, volunteers have stepped forward to help their local communities, uh, to be able to donate personal protective equipment, to be able to do all kinds of things, to be able to step forward and take an active role in uh, dealing with this crisis. So I think there's plenty happening. Obviously, could more happen? Yes, it's not like everything that could be done has been done. But that's a great question, Ken. I can jump have another in question perhaps. about... Uh, Gunjan, yes. I, I want to add also, so a lot of the uh, philanthropic efforts to fight this uh, pandemic uh, takes the form of research into a vaccine or into treatments that uh, ultimately will apply the world over. And there, the Gates Foundation in the US has played a huge role with Bill Gates devoting billions of dollars to funding the opening of several vaccine manufacturing plants, uh, uh, you know, knowing full well that he, he may not, that some of them will actually not be used because the vaccine won't be effective, but taking this risk, you know, of funding seven, six or seven of those plants in the hopes that two of them will actually uh, come online and be ready when the vaccine is approved for, for mass uh, production so that it can then be uh, uh, you know, uh, diffused. And I, I would add to that that people, and particularly with reference to India right now, are, are very concerned about the economic consequences of the lockdown and particularly its, its effects on, on the poorest uh, portion of the population. You know, it's about a quarter of the Indian population, last I checked, that lives on less than $2 a day. And a uh, widespread pandemic that would lead to a closure of the country will have pretty dramatic effects on their uh, livelihoods. And so, uh, you know, you could even, uh, you know, you could even think about uh, moving below the level of subsistence. And so uh, a lot of NGOs are now trying to prepare for this. I know that in the economics community, uh, there are lots of development economists that are worrying about this possibility uh, that it's not only the health effects of the COVID uh, pandemic, but it's it, it, the indirect effects of the, of the closure that comes to fight it on, uh, on people's ability to secure food and basic necessities. So I think you're, you're seeing already people mobilize in the global development community to try to address this or at least preemptively have a, a plan in place on what to do. And just yesterday, I was reading plans from uh, you know, various centers on global development. The one based at the London School of Economics has a very detailed plan uh, specifically tailored to uh, 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 developing countries and particularly to India because they have a lot of involvement there. Right, absolutely. Thank you for that, Roman. You know, there are another question. Are yes. US India based nonprofit organizations also, which are stepping up their efforts as we speak to support this interim time when, as Roman mentioned, the, the heat is felt more by those daily wage earners who are absolutely out of work because of this. And I can, um, America India Foundation is one, Akshay Patra Foundation of America is another one, which, is, which has several kitchens all over India and is making food and distributing it to people, especially to the migrant worker community of India. 
Right, right. And, and, I, and I know, Ravi, that your wife is actively involved in supporting, you know, the, the this, this massive effort to feed millions yes, of people, yes. uh, school they, children, they, on a regular basis. And now these migrant workers yeah. who are who are uh, essentially stranded yeah. uh, as when a result the of the shutdown. Closed, when the schools are closed, yeah. they are the uh, they have to become the beneficiaries of these midday meal programs, and that activity has been carried out. Uh, at uh, military level, really, right now, which is fantastic. Yeah. So, for those of you who are not familiar with Akshay Patra, it's a non-profit organization that started in India, and it runs industrial-scale kitchens to feed school children. And to the, the idea is that many children of poor parents may not attend school and be, you know, be forced to work. But if they are going to get a good, hearty meal at school, then they are likely to show up in school every day. And it's just been a massive effort all across the country. Their kitchens are run at Six Sigma quality and producing nice, healthy, wholesome food. And it's been expanding pretty much all across the country. So it's, it's uh, a lot of the funding comes from US donors, some yeah. Indian Americans, some companies that uh, match their funding and so on. And it's been a remarkable uh, phenomenon to see that. So thank you so much for bringing that up, Ravi. Um, we have another question from, uh, from uh, 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 an attendee about the spread of misinformation uh, comparing what happens in India versus the USA. Um, WhatsApp groups in India are often the source of very rapid spread of you know, fake news, similar to what we've seen here in the US on Facebook over the last several years. Uh, so is there a scope of collaboration between the US and India on this particular issue? Uh, so let me give you my perspective. If you look at how Facebook is trying to track down fake news, they're actually deploying thousands of people in India actually watching those, those posts and those, uh, those forums. And because Facebook itself is a forum where you can watch those things and kind of tame them, it's much easier to do. WhatsApp, however, is end-to-end -end encrypted. So only the sender and the recipient get to see what is being sent. So it's a much harder technically to control that. Now, the Indian government has tried to step in many times, uh, you know, and particularly in sensitive uh, political areas. They, they shut down the internet periodically, which has its own issues. Uh, I don't know that there is a, there's a specific technical solution. But really, the US and India are already working together because the nature of this media business uh, brings the two countries together with their workforces. Uh, does anybody want to add to that further? Well, I am not uh, aware, besides, of course, the technical collaboration that's going on between the software companies. And as you mentioned, there are literally hundreds of thousands of Indians who are looking at this material and advising uh, companies in the US. But I, I do want to talk a little bit about free democracies and the freedom to say things and do things um, and what the technology allows us to do. Those problems are no different in India than they're here. Uh, in fact, sometimes they're worse in India because not everyone's level of education is as high as it is in the United States. And these are serious problems that governments have to deal with without getting into draconian measures or getting into an autoc autocratic model that China has. So it's an evolving situation that will continue to be worked on on an ongoing basis. Absolutely. So we are going to speed up the thing because there's only five minutes left. Uh, there's a question from the audience, uh, which has an assumption built in, for years, India resisted globalization. Will the current pandemic reverse the trend towards integration in the world economy? Well, so let, if you take the long perspective, you know, India was global 2000 years ago. India was, a, you know, India was trading with the rest of the world very vigorously before the British showed up and locked up the trade and set up the monopoly of the East India Company. Indians by their very nature, Indian entrepreneurs and Indian business people by their very nature are globalists. You know, Indians live in Africa and 
you know, and South America and the United States, and they carry this trading gene with them wherever they go. The, the slowdown in this really happened after India became independent and uh, had a very strong socialist government with uh, Prime Minister Nehru. But after 1991, the country has begun to open up and open up vigorously. So if you drive a Jaguar, you're driving an Indian car today. You know, if you take tetracycline or if you take, um, uh, uh, you know, any painkiller, aspirin or uh, uh, acetaminophen, chances are that it was produced in India. You know, I'm with Kaiser and most of my medications, you know, my diabetes medication from Kaiser is actually produced in India. So there's a tremendous amount of globalization happening, uh, but unlike the globalization from China, which is very visible at Walmart, you know, the globalization from India is not so visible. When India buys the C-17 aircraft, only Boeing and a few other people know about it, right? India is the largest importer of weapons and equipment in the world. And today the United States is the largest source of this for, the, for India. So a lot is happening, but you don't see it at Walmart. You don't see it, you know, uh, you know, at the grocery stores. And that's why people sometimes don't realize it. There's a lot of questions about the next US presidential election. I'm going to avoid those because we can't tell what's going to happen in those elections. So I'm, I'm not ignoring those questions, but I, I don't think this panel can actually address them in a meaningful manner. Uh, the... Uh, so final question, what specific industries are impacted? Uh, what specific industries are impacted by the US-India trade agreement initiated by Trump? Or is it to have no impact? I'm not sure what India-US trade agreement uh, this person is referring to, but in general, can you answer the question of which industries will see better trade between the two countries based on what has happened recently. Ravi, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. I think um, the finance industry is going to be the most impacted, and I'll tell you why. In order to foster trade, from US side at least, a US seller needs a financial guarantee from his buyer in India. And when the Indian buyer tries to give him the financial guarantee, by opening a letter of credit in favor of the US seller, that letter of credit remains negotiable only at certain banks in USA. And those banks are restricted to be the banks which are under direct control of the government of India. So if the trade between US and India is going to foster a big deshackling or a huge agreement has to happen between the two countries on the way the financial guarantees from a buyer and seller will be recognized and uh, accepted by the seller. The seller is not going to step up taking a huge amount of open credit and then go to the US Exim Bank to cover it and all those things. It has to happen through commercial banking channels but that can happen only if the trade negotiations will unlock that security the Indian government puts on its banks. Absolutely. I think that's a really valid point. I mean, if you want to sell to the Indian Ministry of Defense, you almost have to be with the State Bank of India. And, uh, you know, it's not, not, not necessarily the only choice that American companies want to consider. So it works on the flip side as well. The final question from an anonymous attendee saying, if you were to pick which relationship is most important to India in the next 10 years, would it be the United States or would it be China? And I think I can speak for our panel uh, on this question that it would, from India's perspective, it would definitely be the United States uh, on all fronts, political, business, cultural. If anybody disagrees with me on that, uh, please tell me your reasons. I think uh, we'd all want to know that. Well, I'd like to kind of say that you cannot ignore China. Of course. You still have to create another relationship. Probably it's not, sometimes one wonders if it is actually more critical than the US relationship because it is a whole different form of government. But 
The number one, I agree with you, the relationship between US and India, but India also needs to develop sufficiently positive relationship with China. Absolutely. I can jump in. I, I, I think that uh, I'm not sure which one is more important, but I'm uh, more confident in predicting that the US-India relationship will be much more harmonious than the India-China relationship. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you, panelists. Uh, Roman Vakshyar, Praful Kulkarni, Ravi Tilak, uh, you've been wonderful. Uh, Dick Drobnik, thank you so much for chairing the Asia Society and for making this event possible. I hope uh, the audience got some good value. Now, most of us can be found on LinkedIn. So if you have a burning question for, uh, for me or for any of the panelists, uh, probably the best place to start would be to send us a message on LinkedIn. And uh, Dr. Drobnik has some final words for us. Go ahead. Uh, unmute yourself, please, Richard. Yeah, I, I also want to thank the panelists. Uh, I enjoyed this evening and I learned quite a bit and that's always a, a, a goal when, in, in these things. So thank you, thank you to, to Gunjan yourself, to Ravi, to Roman and to Praful. And I want to thank our co-sponsors, uh, TAI, the Indus Entrepreneur Association of Southern California, and of course the Alumni Association of Indian Institutes of Technology. Now I want to give our panelists and our viewers a gift, a three minute gift that's gonna happen right now that you will all enjoy and be inspired by. And it's a, a short, remarkable video that was produced over the weekend to honor the doctors, nurses, and first responders who are all on the front lines of the war on the pandemic. Uh, this video was produced over the weekend by a member of the Asia Society of Southern California's uh, board uh, Dr. Siegel Sung, and with many, many uh, helpers and students and so on and so forth. It's titled, We Are In This Together. Lee or Anjali, would you please play it? Stay-at-home orders. The uh, 